are colleagues and friends of mine. Uh, but, but my respect and, and reverence for what they do has gone up because I, I think they're all, str all three struggling with a really, really fundamental problem that has a very venerable philosophical history. So let, let me tell you about that. So uh, all three of our speakers have talked about uh, a bunch of values or themes that they have argued are essential for understanding human behavior and human uh, psychopathology. So inequality, belief, I, I should have put meaning, Amir referred to meaning, much more uh, important even than expectation in the context of placebo. Uh, so these are very familiar, very important, uh, and of course very ancient ideas uh, in thinking about human behavior. Um, but those ideas have been challenged, uh, and the original challenge actually came in the, in the 17th century with Newton. So with Newton, we get the very first real scientific theory, real, a theory that could really explain the physical world. And this presented a huge philosophical problem, most famously addressed by Immanuel Kant, uh, who after Aristotle is probably the most important philosopher in the Western tradition. And Kant is trying, in his most famous work, Critique of Pure Reason, he's trying to come to grips with the implication of Newtonian mechanics. And the implications are very simple. Human beings, among other things, are physical objects. And if Newtonian mechanics purports, and in fact succeeds at explaining physical, the, ob the behavior of physical objects, then it can also explain our behavior. And if it explains our behavior, then all of this stuff is no longer relevant. You can say everything you want to say about human behavior without referring to these things. And if you're Kant, and indeed if you're us, that's a big problem. Now for Kant, the things that were challenged were God, freedom, and immora uh, morality. Uh, and he opts for a certain strategy, whereas he says, I found it necessary to deny knowledge. He, he wants to claim that we know less about behavior than, than we think. Uh, but he really is trying to come to grips with the idea, the new idea, that human beings are physical as well as something else. Not, it's not a new idea that human beings are physical, but it's a new idea that we can explain human behavior by appealing to theories of physical objects. Here's a, a modern Kantian, a bit of a hero of mine, uh, Wilfred Sellers, uh, and he has the same view. He says the philosopher is confronted by two pictures of essentially the same order of complexity, each of which purports to be a complete picture of man in the world, in which after separate scrutiny he must fuse into one vision. The two pictures are the scientific picture of, hum of human beings as physical objects, and by physical objects, I mean brains too, of course, paradigmatically brains, uh, and this other picture of human beings as having values, making choices, being free, be, trying to be moral, and so on and so forth. And the question is, wh what do we do to put these two things together if we want to? We might abandon one, uh, but that's not very appealing. So there's a gap, right? There's a gap in the theory of the mind, and it's a gap that has been there certainly since the 17th century in a very, very powerful way, and it continues to be there. And I think that part of the development of, uh, of the sort of uh, celebrity neuroscience that Sparna talked about is uh, a result of trying to deny this gap. Not address it, but deny it. So on the one hand, we have human beings as social and cultured, free, moral, and so on. And on the other, we have human beings as physical objects and mechanisms. And we really don't know how to put these two things t together. Now, contemporary neuroscience, I think, is in a state of denial, uh, and or it's in a state of ignorance. And I think uh, contemporary cognitive neuroscience and contemporary psychiatry, I'm sorry to say, when I say contemporary psychiatry, I have this idea of there being what I call aspirational psychiatry, right? So there's, there's actual psychiatry that's practiced in this building and in other buildings, and you know, that's filled with all sorts of things. There's drugs, and there's dance therapy, and there's what, placebos, and there's any number of things, right? Uh, but then there's aspirational psychiatry. And aspirational psychiatry is if you ask your colleagues, you know, where you think psychiatry will be in 50 years, or maybe where they'd like it to be, what they're gonna say is they'd like it to be clinical neuroscience. Or maybe they, they fear it will be clinical neuroscience. But that's where it's going. And so contemporary psychiatry and contemporary cognitive neuroscience simply asserts, as it were, that because human beings are brains, after all, or brains and bodies, or connectomes, or synap you know, synapses, or who, you know, depending on, on, on your particular uh, view, of course psychiatry uh, and cognitive neuroscience will be able to explain human behavior and psychopathology. We're all new brains, after all. And so uh, we're committed to this view, but this view seems to be well-grounded in a, in a bit of 
common sense, okay? And the common sense just goes like this. The mind is nothing more than the brain and what it does. I mean, what other option could there be, right? The mind is not in the kidney, it's not in the heart, it's not in the foot, it's not in my sock, it's in my brain. That's trivial. Um, but if the mind is nothing more than the functioning brain, then the theory of the mind must be a theory of the brain. I mean, that just seems like a fact of logic, right? I'm not trying to convince you of anything, I'm just following up the consequences. So if that's true, then, then understanding the brain must tell us everything there is to know <coughs> excuse me, about human beings, including about your adolescent, and about you, how to make money, and how to, you know, Suparna didn't have my favorite one up there, which is, which is the brain diet. Uh, I recommend it. Um, it doesn't involve eating brains, actually. Um, so, uh, of course, if, if all we are are brains, then all, all there is to understanding us is understanding, is understanding our brains. But that's actually what philosophers call a fallacy. A fallacy is a bad argument, but it's a bad argument of a certain seductive kind, because it looks very good. But let me show you why it's a bad argument. Uh, I'm going to show you it's a bad argument by analogy. Think of earthquakes, OK? So that's my picture of an earthquake. Here's the, here's the exact parallel argument that I just gave you applied to earthquakes. An earthquake is nothing over and above moving atoms, right? That's just like brain is, uh, mind is nothing over and above a brain. What other option could there be, after all? Uh, but if an earthquake is nothing over and above moving atoms, <coughs> then a theory of earthquakes must be a theory of atoms, and so on. But as a matter of fact, we have a good theory of earthquakes. It's called plate tectonics, and atoms are never mentioned. Does that mean that earthquakes are not atomic events? Of course not. They are atomic events. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the best description of those atomic events makes reference to atoms. Similarly, of course minds are functioning brains, but it doesn't follow from that at all that the best theory of the mind is the theory of the brain. Okay? So there's a big difference between what you might think of as metaphysics, right? that the world, you know, from God's point of view, is nothing more than atoms. That's obviously true. It's a big difference between that picture, which we all accept, and the picture that says, oh, therefore science must go one way or another. How science goes depends entirely on what real human beings actually really manage to achieve in real scientific endeavors. And that's a, that's a contingent social, social event. <coughs> so where we get explanation, you have a question? I have a problem with the analogy. What you're saying is... Ha hang on, hang on. Uh, uh, etiquette in these things requires that you wait. So let me finish, uh, because otherwise I'll never get through. Um, I, used to, I used to tolerate this, but then my students uh, told me that my students got very annoyed with all the questions because I felt I never got through the material, you know, and they want me to get through the material because there's an exam at the end of it. So, so I'm going to just hold, hold the question. I promise I'll answer it. Um, so look, where we find explanation of things, where we find patterns in the universe, uh, to, you know, is entirely up for grabs. Uh, we might find it in space-time patterns. We might find it in evolution and so on. Um, or, and here's the claim, we might find it in these concepts. We might find it in theories having to do with inequality, belief, meaning, expectation, and so on. Uh, now, have I crossed the, the gap? No, I haven't. I, I won't tell you in detail why. I, I haven't crossed the gap, and if anyone ever tells you they have, then you should disbelieve them, okay? I mean, if, unless they're from Harvard or something. But in general, I mean, I would, your, your view should be this is a very, very hard gap to cross, and it, it's not going to be crossed unless you really show me. There are reasons why I think it's going to be very hard to cross, uh, and we can talk about that if you like. However, in, in the absence of a solution about how to cross this gap, uh, I think what we ought to do is not deny the gap, but simply sort of reach across it and ignore it. Okay, so we don't do not, we agree that it's there, but I think what we ought to do is simply try to try to work around it. And by work around it, I mean we ought to simply throw in everything that we need. And if it turns out that we need the notion of inequality to understand the psychopathological behavior of people in other countries, then we better throw it in. We better not say, well, look, we're going to leave it out because that doesn't fit with our story. We'll wait for somebody to tell us a story about neurons and how neurons can explain the behavior that we're now explaining with inequality. So I think because explanation can come from any number of places, we better take our explanation where we can get it, including uh, from social science and, and other places. And I'll end just with uh, something that Saparna talked about. So, um, you know, it, one doesn't want to be churlish and complain about money going to neuroscience research. I mean, I'm a big fan of neuroscience research, right? I, I, I like neuroscience. Um, and one doesn't want to be churlish, but it is. <laughs> 
was, is that we're going to learn something, no doubt, from uh, Obama's money, but we're not going to learn anything about what, what he thinks we're going to learn about. Now, sh should we say he shouldn't do it? Well, no, because I think all research is a bet. Okay? The fact that at the moment we need things from all over uh, so, uh, social science and natural science doesn't mean that maybe one day we won't have a theory of uh, the mind in terms of neurons. That's a possibility. Uh, as I said before, how science goes is a function of human beings and what they do, not a function of the nature of the universe. So I can't stand here and tell you it can't happen. But if we're going to take a bet, and it's rational to take a bet, right? So Obama's taking, or whoever is taking a bet, that we're going to understand mental function at the level of microstructure. If we're going to take a bet, let's be honest about the fact that it's a bet, right? So there's nothing wrong with being rational, rational taking a bet. What's irrational is saying that the bet's guaranteed, because after all, we're just made up of neurons, right? If we're just connectomes, then we can't lose. I think that's irrational, and that's something that we should stand up against. Thank you. Okay, so...